For the past several weeks, Pastor Nelson has been telling us about unexpected callings, focusing on some biblical figures from the Old Testament. First, he told us about Abraham's call, a call to trust. In that sermon, he defined calling by saying that you are created by God on purpose and with a purpose. We must accept and trust in God's faithfulness. Then he told us about the call of Moses, a call to surrender. He explained three types of calling, a universal call, which is for all creation to turn to God, a kingdom call, which is a call to advance the kingdom by following the example of Jesus and an individual or specific calling, which is unique to each of us. Next, we talked about Joshua's call, a call to move forward. A calling requires movement, to move forward and trust that God will always be with those he calls. There are lots of women mentioned in the Bible. But in the Gospels, Jesus only tells us to remember one of them. At Luke 17.32, he says, Remember Lot's wife. Do you remember what happened to her? When she looked back towards the past, she became a pillar of salt. Keep looking and moving forward. Last week, we heard about Gideon's call, a call to purpose. A calling requires resilience and flexibility. We sometimes have to find solutions under less than ideal or comfortable conditions. Today, we turn our attention to Isaiah and his call to holiness. Isaiah's call is of a different nature than those we have heard about, but we'll discuss that in a few minutes. First, Let's hear how he received his call as written in Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pastor Nelson has only been with us for a few weeks, and I'm not sure he knows exactly how to take me yet. Upon learning that this was today's scripture, I got excited. I told him I was going to put a flaming hibachi on the altar and I was going to have all the children and youth running around with six wings on yelling, holy, holy, holy. Well, he can relax. I only brought the tongs. And I can't help but wonder if the seraphim had to do like we do and test click them three times before we use them. 
But anyway, as I said earlier, Isaiah's call is different from the others we've studied so far. Abraham, Moses, Joshua, and Gideon were all assigned tasks with a specific, tangible goal. Isaiah, however, is called to be a prophet, to deliver God's message to the people. Also, the previous individuals were promised a positive outcome for their tasks. As we find in the verses following today's reading, it is very different for Isaiah. He is basically told that the people may hear his message, but that they would not listen and would not understand. When reading today's passage, I wondered why there were five chapters of prophecy before the story of Isaiah's calling. I never really answered that question, but did gain some insight into the nature of his messages. It's not good news. He is foretelling the condemnation and destruction of God's chosen people. What is God disappointed and angered by? It goes back to that overarching theme of the Bible that I always mention, love of our fellow people. God speaks out about the people not caring for the widows and orphans and those taking advantage of the poor, and he is disgusted by their meaningless offerings. So who is Isaiah? The text doesn't tell us much, but that he is the son of Amos, who tradition tells us was the brother of Amaziah, a former king of Judah. So Isaiah was close to the ruling family, and other sources tell us that he was a scribe. The name Isaiah translates as Yahweh saves. He prophesied from approximately 750 to 700 BC and during the reign of four different kings of Judah. He is the most frequently quoted prophet in the New Testament. Was Isaiah destined to fail? The following verses tell us that the people would not listen or understand his words. They were a proud people believing that they were blessed by God and safe. But Isaiah's message was that God was going to destroy them due to their disobedience. So Isaiah was probably really popular, right? Hardly. God was eloquent in describing his disappointment with his people. He described them as a vineyard which he had planted, tended with care, and protected with a wall. But even with all of his planting and nurturing, the plants did not produce but a few grapes. He described that he would tear down the wall and let the vineyard go to ruin. When Isaiah received his calling, What a vision it was. The throne room of God Almighty, smoky and attended by seraphim, special angels of the Lord. When they spoke, the very foundations shook. This brings us to the first step of Isaiah's transformation, sanctification. What does it mean to be sanctified or become holy? we can turn to John Wesley's understanding of grace to help us understand. Wesley broke grace down into three phases we experience as we journey through this life. The first he named is prevenient grace, the grace that exists before we know God or turn to Jesus. God's grace is ever-present and given to us before we are even aware of it. Secondly, he named justifying grace, that point where we recognize and accept God's grace in the face of our sinfulness and begin to live in that light. 
Lastly is what Wesley termed sanctifying grace, a moving on toward perfection, living up to the example of Jesus. While becoming sanctified is an ongoing process for us, Isaiah became sanctified when touched by the hot coal. It wasn't that coal that cleansed him, but God. When faced with his call and the magnificence of his vision, Isaiah was suddenly very aware of his sinful nature and cried out. A seraph touched his lips with a burning coal and declared him free from guilt. I'm kind of glad that our sanctification, sanctification may be a little slower process. We've seen in the previous men that some of them were very reluctant to accept or follow their callings. Isaiah, once sanctified, steps forward as a willing participant in God's plan. In his calling, Isaiah must become holy. We are told throughout scripture of the holiness of God. His holiness is testified to in his purity, perfection, and flawlessness. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and without fault or mistake. Holiness is the character of our God. A lot of emphasis is placed on developing a personal relationship with God, especially through our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is important during this relationship that we not forget how great God is. How wonderful, amazing, powerful, majestic, and holy is our God. We need to be careful not to turn him into a Santa Claus God who is there to fulfill our personal wishes and desires. As followers of our callings and disciples of Jesus, we are called to be holy, to live a life where everything we do honors and pleases God. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 through 16, it is stated, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who has called you is holy, be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Holy living is not a life absent, absent of mistakes or setbacks, but holy living is a life actively seeking to do what is right before God. It is living a life of progress to shape and conform our lives to the image of Christ. Holy living is a life of discipline and focus, a life of prayer and searching God's truth in scripture and applying it in our lives. It is a life pleasing to God on all levels a life lived in service to those whom Jesus would refer to as the least of these. Was Isaiah's task an easy one? Far from it. Doing and saying the right thing is often difficult and uncomfortable. But we must do the right things, knowing that God is always with us. These men chosen by God that we have studied these last few weeks have been marked by differences. Some were reluctant to answer their call and needed convincing. Others answered readily and accepted their tasks. Some were given concrete goals that would be accomplished and others were sent into the unknown. With Isaiah, he was given the task of prophecy while being told his hearers would not listen to or understand his message. His words were not all gloom and doom, though. 
his message also contained promises from God that a right relationship with his people would eventually be restored. Though their differences were many, we can see things in common with each of them. They each received their callings from God, and God promised to always be with them. They each said yes and accepted their assignments. They each surrendered themselves to God's plans. They all trusted in God's promises. They all realized that they were created by God on purpose and with a purpose. They all chose to move forward. Even Isaiah answered God's question, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us by saying, Here am I, send me. Pastor Nelson has been telling us each week that we were all created by God with a purpose. God wants to use our lives, our gifts, our abilities, our profession, our friends, our circles of influences, everything we are and everything we have in his project of reconciliation and redemption of the world. But for that to happen, we need to align ourselves in our lives with God. Not with a Santa Claus God, but with the real God, the Holy One, merciful, filled with compassion, kindness, ready to forgive, and ready to love, the God whose arms are stretched wide. God is calling us to experience more of Him. Come closer to God. Allow God to touch you with His holiness. Allow God to change your life according to His will. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you in serving God with your gifts so the world around you may experience real transformation through the Holy Spirit of God. When you feel that little nudge on your spirit, or maybe something a little stronger, trust God. Say yes to his calling. Surrender to him and move forward in holiness. Amen.